Okay, welcome everybody to this week's CEDAR seminar. I'm Lisa Goldberg, uh, one of CEDAR's co-directors, and it is my um, extreme pleasure to introduce my friend and collaborator, Haim Barr of University uh, of Connecticut, who is um, presenting today uh, on a subject. Are you gonna flip back, Haim, to the to the front page, no? Um, so people can yes. see who you are? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, who um, is is uh, go pursuing in a um, slightly different direction than we've done before, uh, algorithms in very high dimensions where uh, the number of parameters or predictors or what have you is, is way ahead of the number of observations. This is something we've talked about. This is like a whole new angle on it. And so um, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Haim to talk about graphical models and convex Geometry, I am over to you. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you for uh, the invitation. Uh, uh, working with Lisa this has been great, and uh, we have joint interest and enthusiasm about this talk. And I, uh, I hope uh, convex geometry and high dimensional uh, uh, data excites all of you. Uh, this is joint work with Marty Wells from Cornell. <clears throat> the paper that's uh, already recently published on uh, this is in uh, CSDA, uh, but there is some new stuff as well. Uh, besides the excitement about the topic itself, I see now that you're also going to get a glimpse into the future because I noticed that the date is 2028. So uh, very good for finance people to know what's going to happen in five years. So uh, hang on to your seats. Uh, so the... In general, I'm going to motivate what I do through four examples. I'm actually going to focus more on some and less on others. And I've actually added a couple that I'm going to talk about only at the end when I've, I've presented my uh, method. Uh, <clears throat> after the introduction to motivate where I uh, where I got to, uh, to do that, um, I'm going to talk about penalization methods, which are more prevalent in uh, using high dimensional data. I'm going to point out why they're inadequate in many cases. And then I'm going to talk about convex geometry, which is only going to be scratching the surface of this wonderful area uh, to the extent that we will need in this talk. Then I'm going to introduce our model, which we call the beta mix, and you will see why. Uh, after that, I'll show you some simulations and uh, data analysis with the motivating examples, and that's it. So. First example comes from genomics, uh, and for a long time that was the uh, area which has driven most of what I did. Uh, there is no shortage in data and it's very challenging and a lot of the traditional methods don't really work that great. Uh, and this data set has been uh, used widely and published, uh, a lot of stuff was published on it. It was originally introduced by Buhlmann and others in 2014. It has uh, expression data, gene expression data for 4,088 genes, and the number of samples is only 71. Uh, they are assumed to be independent. We're going to talk about that a bit. <clears throat> and the objective in this kind of study is to detect which of the genes is a predictor for, in our case, the response is uh, vitamin B2 uh, production rate of this bacteria called Bacillus subtilis. Um, and the method that most people use or the way that they describe the, the challenge is by fitting a linear model where the log production rate of this vitamin is a linear function of all the gene expression data, all the predictors, plus some random normal error as usual. Uh, and the way this is attacked by most people, especially by Buhlmann and others, was using the lasso and uh, finding which of the coefficients are significant. And I'll get back to their results later. Uh, there are some underlying assumptions uh, which we challenge. Uh, one is that the regression model is um, requires uh, that in order to estimate any of the coefficients, uh, we do that while we hold all the other variables fixed. And not just fixed, but fixed at their mean level. <clears throat> the other thing is that when you have a linear model like that, uh, you implicitly uh, uh, use the, the, the interpretation that a unit change in some predictor, let's say xj, is associated with beta j units increase or decrease in y. 
Uh, another assumption is that the variables are independent, not just the subjects, but the genes are independent. And that is required in order for the covariance matrix to be estimable. So X transpose X is invertible. And finally, but probably most prevalently, is that the number of coefficients that are significant is assumed to be very small compared to the total number of variables. So that's something we call beta sparsity, not we, but the literature. <clears throat> the second example is related to graphical models. Uh, it's a little bit more general. And in this case, we use an example from uh, metabolomics, so again, from uh, uh, the biological uh, sciences. Casmi uh, and others used this rather interesting experiment where they took 100 recombinant inbred lines and they divided them into two groups, and 50 were given one treatment, which was just keep the seeds dry, and 50 were imbibed for six hours. And what they did was they measured metabolites, and there are maybe 200, but 68 named, and that's the size I'm going to use. Please, in this case, it's smaller, but um, what we're, they're interested in is combinations of uh, metabolites, how they change uh, in response to the treatment, and that is of uh, critical importance to uh, uh, agriculture because that's how they can optimize the seed's ability to germinate. Uh, <clears throat> the goal Sorry. in this case... Yes. Hi, I forgot to ask. It's okay to interrupt, I presume? Absolutely, absolutely. No no it, problem. Yes. Yeah, imbibed means it just get, it's got wet or something? Yes, yes. Okay. That's the word they used in their paper. Uh, to me, it sounds ah. like they make it drunk, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now it just means that they soak it in uh, water, and uh, yeah. When I was in elementary school, we did that with uh, avocado seeds and and all, and all that. So that's that's what they. Do. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. Sure. Uh, I I also chuckled when I first saw it in the paper, but uh, okay. So their goal is to construct. Uh, metabolomic network. They they do not assume, uh, like in the previous example, that metabolo metabol metabolite uh, levels are independent of one another, uh, and they want to see how they change together. So we call it co-expression data. Third example, completely unrelated to the previous two, but our model applies to that as well. This is data from the North American Breeding Bird Survey. And every year, at the, around the same time in June, uh, experts around the U.S. volunteer to to go and count birds. So they have to be experts in order to have to provide good identification of species. And they are assigned like 30 miles of road, and they go along this road and they just count which species they saw. And at the end, after uh, cleaning up the data, we have. 600 birds, this is in one year, but this is longitudinal data, but only one year is presented here, uh, over 601 locations. So we have the abundance of species in each location as our data. Uh, and what we really want to get out of this kind of data is to find a spatial covariance matrix uh, empirically. So a lot of times with spatial models, people use assumed structures, assumed covariance structures, and they may not be very realistic because there is no boundary condition. So the, the, the Gaussian, for example, if they assume may spill over to the ocean and there is nothing there, so it's it's not appropriate. So we were uh, hoping to get a, uh, a way to get the covariance estimation based on actual data. Uh, and this is, again, a case where you cannot assume independence because adjacent locations are dependent, birds uh, fly from one to another easily. Uh, so the spatial correlation is something that we wanted to account for. The fourth example has to do with classification, and that will be hopefully related to models that you've all seen. Uh, when I get to it later, to see a model, a model that you've seen in previous talks uh, in your seminar series. Uh, but in this case, uh, the data I used is from the uh, machine learning repository. It's called the ionosphere data. And what, what's in this data set is um, observations from radar. So they aimed radar at the, at the space, and they wanted to see from the return signal if they get um, some, some signal that um, hints to the location of free electrons. 
Uh, then when they look at the data, they have to classify at the time manually if the uh, response is good, good or bad. And um, they have 32 continuous attributes based on frequency and other measurements that they can easily measure from the return signal from the radar. And one uh, binary outcome, which is the uh, classification of an expert, which is done again manually of good and bad. Uh, we have 126 bad cases and 225 good ones, and we only use 60 of each type for training. And our goal is whether we can find an automated way to uh, uh, determine the, whether the return signal is good or bad without the intervention of human, human experts. So those are the four examples we're going. Yep. Got another question there. So you do use the rest of the data test. That's why you yes. don't use all of it. Isn't yes. that kind of small? 60? Uh, yes. I, but I, I, but I also, the, the this looks like, suppose we did a, a really great classifier. Would we have a, a lot of confidence with only a little more than, not, not very many, um, test data. Right. So uh, this is what they have in this data in a simulation that I did with um, uh, with a case like this. I, I increase it to a much larger data set, but this is what there is there. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. I hope that answered or it will be answered in when I show the analysis. Uh, in general, this is a fairly small data set, but 60 for training uh, is not very large, but it's large enough with the model because of what I'm going to talk about. Okay. So, like I said before, when we talked about the, uh, uh, it, it's been done also for the graphical models, the second example and the first example of regression, the most prevalent way of dealing with such uh, questions is to use uh, sparse models. And usually that means using the lasso or some derivative of the lasso. And all those uh, methods rely on an assumption that translates to this uh, fact here that the logarithm of the number of predictors has to be a constant number. It has to be little o of one. Uh, so for example, Van de Geer and others uh, show that. And there is a great paper by Martin Wainwright from 2009 who showed that in the case of a standard Gaussian, which is mostly what people have looked at, uh, he shows some interesting results. A is the lasso can only recover the regression coefficients uh, if the number of actually uh, significant betas is bounded. And it's bounded by this term here that has something to do with uh, n over two log of p. But more importantly, he showed that uh, it fails. The lasso fails to detect the, the actual relationship between the predictors and the outcome with probability converging to one, if there are some numbers C1 and C2 greater than zero, such that the true number of predictors is between C1P and C2P. So that means that the number of actual predictors has to be really small. So it has to be close enough to zero. It cannot be bounded away from zero. No matter how small it is, it cannot be bounded away. If it is, then with probability one, uh, as you increase P, uh, the lasso methods will fail to detect the, sig the signals. Uh, and then there is the inverse relationship that he points out, that if the number of true predictors, the, all the betas that are not zero, uh, is some alpha times p, and alpha is some number between zero and one, then in order for lasso to work, they need to have a sample size that's proportional to p times log of p, times the one minus alpha that's required. Uh, that's a very large number, usually unattainable. Uh, in the context of covariance matrix estimation, that's also related to that, Bickel and Levina uh, worked with the same set of assumptions, and they showed that uh, you have to have that log of p divided by n. So n has to grow to infinity much larger than log of p. Uh, so that's just telling you something about the uh, proportion of the, the sample size that's required to estimate when p is large. Um, and there is an underlying assumption of sparsity that every row and every column in the covariance matrix is sparse. So the number of non-zero elements in each row of the covariance matrix is small. 
So, um, can, I, can I ask a, a question on that? Uh, it, yeah. it, it looks uh, the, the lasso. I have very little ex experience with lasso. All of the experience I've had is bad, but uh, it didn't work. But I, I don't know if it was for any of these reasons. It's widely used, and it looks like you're saying that uh, maybe it doesn't work so well for theoretical reasons. We can say in lots of cases. Do people yep. just use it anyway and not check, or are there cases where it's really successful? So it... I think I think it has a chance if it meets the the conditions in any one of these theorems. So sparsity is key, and if it's not, then it, it doesn't work. And the consequence of it not working is failure to detect any significant uh, uh, predictors. Um, especially this becomes even worse when you're dealing with estimation of networks or covariance or correlation matrices that are not sparse, that are not truly sparse, like in the uh, requirement in Bickel and Levina, uh, they, um, they just not have, they don't have power. And all of our simulations show that, and, and as, as you increase the correlation between the betas, and that's on the next slide as well, uh, between the, the coefficient between the x's, uh, it gets even worse. So uh -huh. yeah, it's not, it, it lacks power and well, the original lasso is also biased. So there is a de-biased version of the lasso, but the bias is not the big issue here. The big issue here is that uh, P has to be, or N has to be very large in order to be able to estimate or to get to re, uh, get the true model or get the true uh, relationship between Y and all the Xs uh, with the lasso. So. Yeah, my experience with that has been also not that it doesn't work uh, very well. It's very popular because it's very simple. It's caught on very, very uh, broadly. But the the requirements of a specific model and, uh, and the, the sparsity are just too strict and not very reasonable in some cases like the ones I'm showing here. Yeah, I, I'm remembering now when I looked at it, we um, kind of understood what was happening because of the shape of the unit ball in the L1 norm, right? You kind of bump into right. these corners. I mean, you, you can you can see what it's doing a little bit, but it, I, I guess our system wasn't, um, the question we were asking was, uh, we had too many predictors and if we ran the lasso, uh, did we, get some, did we get a, a good set of them? And then we did another thing where we just did kind of fundamental analysis. Here are the predictors we thought were relevant and then ran an OLS. And the second thing worked much better. I, I mean, yes. what, what, it was a sparse problem actually, but it, it just didn't, uh, okay. Well, I was maybe a discussion for another time because I'd, I'd be very curious to know like great empirical success stories for this thing. So I think the ones that you will see especially in the papers that deal with cases like, including the one by Wainwright, when, where he goes to, to show uh, more properties of that. Uh, usually they, they work under this regime. So the simulations really assume that they use sparsity. And um, then it just, it, it works well for what it's, uh, you know, what, what it can do. But in the case of genomics or even finance or other things, Sparsity is not a reasonable assumption. And you, I, I feel like somebody would have to be really, to have a compelling argument why something is, uh, some some system like that is sparse. And I, I think it, it's, the, the whole point of this uh, work is to show that you don't have to assume that. It, uh, it's not necessary. Okay, well, thanks. All right. Uh so you kind of uh, uh, set it up for the next slide. So this is very appropriate and very good. Uh, really, in, in the case of genomics, a quantitative trait can depend on many genes uh, and not just a few of them. Uh, some traits are known to be dependent on thousands of genes, not just a handful like Lasso requires. Uh, the other thing that is really not possible, uh, definitely not in genomics, but also not in case of uh, stocks and stuff like that. You cannot hold all other variables constant. That That is a, a, a method that we use mathematically to get the OLS, but it's not a designed experiment. So if you change a gene, it will, it will cascade to other genes as well. So that's not a reasonable 
uh, assumption. Uh, also, the interpretation of a unit increase in uh, a predictor causes a beta J units change in, in, the, in the response. Also not reasonable because genes and stocks, they, they, they work in, in a complicated, very intricate way together in such a way that you cannot just change one and say, okay, this is how much change I'm going to see in the outcome. Sparsity in the covariance matrix uh, can also be invalid assumption. Actually, in many cases, it, it's very reasonable to assume that it's not. Um, for example, it may be necessary for that the trait will, uh, for the production of some protein uh, is, is beneficial for survival, or some, some of them are actually uh, more dangerous. So it's some mutations are dangerous. So, so there is a lot of uh, compensation in in the DNA to make sure that one change in one gene is not uh, uh, lethal. So that's it. And finally, and that's also something that has to be um, understood because we're not used to it from when we talk about regression. Beta doesn't have to be unique. The the vector doesn't have to be unique. If if we're uh, interested in modeling a specific relationship, then that's a natural thing to assume. But uh, for prediction, it definitely is not necessary. And uh, definitely, if you don't have enough samples, maybe some of the betas are interchangeable. And that has to do also with the fact that they change together and they're not independent of one another. Uh, so with that, I conclude the penalization methods, and I'm going to talk a little bit about convex geometry, which is a wonderful topic, and I could talk about it forever, but I won't. I'm only going to say a few things about that. Uh, geometry is, uh, is, is understood by everybody, or so we think, because we are taught geometry in middle school, and we stop at three dimensions, and if we do some advanced physics, uh, we may add the fourth dimension, or sometimes a little bit more. Um, so we have the intuition, but that's uh, we're going to get to that. And, and the the underlying uh, quantity that uh, that we have in mind is the dimension of the space that we're dealing with, and that is determined by how many um, orthogonal vectors we can uh, we can find. So that's the span of the space, and that's something everybody's familiar with. And I'm going to go, come back to this uh, reference also in a few slides again, but a recent work by Kainen and Krakova uh, wanted to relax the orthogonality requirement. So they want, they, they say, okay, we can find a, they can define the dimension of a space up to some epsilon. So they call it epsi quasi orthogonal uh, dimension. And basically what that means is that if you're willing to have something, some deviation from perfect orthogonality, what is now the dimension? So that turns out to be related to what we do. And the relationship of uh, quasi-orthogonality is through what's called spherical caps. And if you think about the sphere, so easy to imagine in 3D, uh, <clears throat> spherical caps are just like if you think about the soccer ball and you think about the, the stitches, the stitch part to it, so that's a spherical cap. Uh, they are defined as all the points on the sphere, such that if you look at the angle between them, so that's the inner product, the absolute value of the inner product, it's less than some epsilon. So nearly uh, perpendicular. That's what that means. Um, and they showed in their paper that there is an exponential number of such quasi-orthogonal vectors in a Euclidean space of dimension n. So if you have Rn instead of R3, then you have an order of e to the n or quasi-orthogonal lines that you can put there such that every pair of them is approximately orthogonal. And what that says is that the dimension of uh, this space is growing exponentially with n. Uh, this is uh, this paper is from 2020, but this results can be can be traced back quite quite a bit. One of the favorite uh, uh, sources for that is a book by uh, Ball. Uh, from 97, and he talked about the Lebesgue measure of the uh, spherical caps. And he showed that the Lebesgue measure of every such spherical cap on, on a sphere is getting smaller uh, at the rate that's you know the inverse of what we saw on the previous slide, e to the minus n. 
times epsilon square over two, but e to the minus n. So again, saying that you can, uh, in order to cover a sphere in Rn, you need an exponential number of uh, uh, spherical caps like that, or you can use an exponential number of non-overlapping spherical caps. So um, that's that's really the same result. And here comes something that really, when I first saw it, I was puzzled and still it's, uh, it, it, at least for me at first, it defied um, intuition. In high dimension, it turns out from the results that most of the area that you, uh, on the sphere, lies close to the equator. And you probably heard uh, similar statements in the previous talks in the seminar series uh, this semester. Uh, I, I still find it magical that that's the case. It's it, When you think about the globe, it doesn't look that way. Uh, but as you increase n, this is just a mathematical fact. And this is what we call, and again, it's a term that you've seen in the previous talks, I'm sure, uh, the concentration of measure phenomena. And we and others refer to it as the blessing of dimensionality. Um, and what this amounts to is that you can, you can say it the following way. You can say that ran random fluctuations are very well controlled in high dimensions. And that's key. I'm going to say it, in other words, in a, in a few minutes. Uh, so mathematically, I'm not going to talk about this a lot because I'm only going to use the terminology for the results, the theorem later. But this goes back to Riemann and uh, uh, what's called Grassmann manifolds. So subspaces of Rn are uh, fall into that category. And they are quotient sets that can be defined in this way. And the main result from this uh, mathematical fact is that under spherical uh, uh, symmetrical assumptions, this the, the manifold of dimension k, the manifold with uh, uh, k uh, uh, sub a subspace of dimension k in R n, it has an invariant measure, um, and this can be used to calculate the volumes of sets. And that's again because up to rotation and uh, other uh, rigid transformations like that, it doesn't matter, and you can measure things in 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 a unique way. <clears throat> And I'm going to skip that a little bit because that's something we haven't touched on in our paper. And just going to say that if you have general subspaces of dimension K, uh, then you know how the uh, principal angles between any two such spaces are distributed in, in principle. Uh, but we're going to focus today mostly or almost entirely on the simple case where <clears throat> the K is one. So we're looking at lines, random lines in Rn, and we want to know something about the distribution of angles between random lines in Rn. So um, for that, we uh, we define the chordal distance, just as you imagine, just the point along between the two points in the sphere. Uh, and it's just equal to the sine of their angle, the angle between the lines. And in this case, this manifold that's uh, that corresponds to uh, k and l equal one to basically lines uh, has an invariant measure. And in this case, it's actually a very easy to uh, to obtain. And when you when you look at the cosine square of the angle between two random lines of the sine square. Uh, you just get that random lines in high dimension tend to have a distribution that's uh, just a better distribution. So we know how to deal with that. So this is just a better distribution. <clears throat> so we're going to use that uh, result. That's key to what we do. And what we're going to use is the fact that sine square of theta between angles of the sine square of theta of angles between random lines in Rn is a beta distribution with parameters that we know, n minus 1 over 2 and 1 half. And this corresponds exactly to results about spherical caps in more recent papers by Hiro and others, and Tsai and Jiang and uh, others as well. Uh, but it actually, it's actually known, uh, has, has been known for a while. Uh, one of my favorite sources for that, a very clear paper on high-dimensional data, is the Frankel and Mahara paper from 1990. And 
uh, the results are mostly quoted from there. So as a consequence, two random vectors are with very high probability approximately perpendicular, provided that the dimension is large enough. And how much large is large? So uh, you can see here, if, if we're only dealing with R10, uh, with dimension 10, this is the blue line here, the solid line here. And you can see that still, even with 10, most of the mass co uh, corresponds to, co is close to one. And one is uh, corresponding, if you take the, if, you, if you're th thinking about the sine square uh, that we talked about, uh, nearly perpendicular lines. But as you increase it, for example, n equals 100 is the red, uh, red dashed line, and 500, it's almost certain that any random lines will be approximately perpendicular. So this is what you see here. So even R10 is a large space. Um, now, in the more general case, if we had to do with uh, to deal with k-dimensional uh, subspaces, uh, which we haven't in the paper, that's a uh, uh, future research open question for us. Uh, still, there is a result that seems very promising. Uh, if you take k and l to be any two random k planes in Rn, and you're looking at the largest principal angle between k and l, and again, you take the sine square of the largest angle, then this has this probability distribution here. Now, this looks a lot like the beta distribution that we saw before, except that it has this hypergeometric function of a matrix. So when k is equal to two, it's still a scalar, still not, doesn't have a closed form uh, uh, representation. But when this is a matrix, this is a lot more complicated and there are no uh, easy ways to, uh, to analyze it. There, are some, there is some software that allows to, to simulate data from that, but this is in general based on infinite sums and products, which uh, I will say as a, uh, as a footnote that I, I tried to simplify it for the case k equals two, which seems easy enough because you end up with a scalar here. And I worked on it for a week and uh, did all, all that I could to simplify it. And then I took a break from it and went back to my notes and saw that the biggest or the biggest names in mathematics in the 19th century tried and could not come up with something simpler than this notation. So maybe if Riemann couldn't do it, I should not uh, continue to spend time on simplifying this function. Uh, <clears throat> but maybe uh, computationally it's possible. Uh, Another key result, which is re uh, really related to the spherical caps that we talked about before. Again, uh, this is, uh, it appears in many places. This is the statement from Frankel and Mahara. Uh, if you take any threshold angle alpha between zero and pi over two, and you ask how many uh, random lines you can draw in Rn so, so that the angle between any two of them any two of them, not just, uh, that's a very strong same, any two of them is at least alpha. So turns out that the number is uh, of order n minus one, uh, square root of n minus one, and then you have here one over sine alpha to the n plus one. The rest are constants, but this is where n comes into play. So I emphasize again, this theorem says any pair among at least this many m uh, randomly chosen lines will be at least with, with the, the angle between them will be at least alpha. So pick alpha and pick n, and I will tell you how many lines at least you can draw at random. So here is an example. If n equals 100 and you want to draw lines so that the angle between any two of them is at least 60 degrees, turns out that you can do almost 13 million random lines without having any pair that has angle between them that's less than 60 degrees. And here is a graph that shows how it changes with n and with the threshold that you choose for what you call near orthogonality. So if you're very uh, uh, liberal about this and you say pi over four is my threshold, I want every angle to be at least pi over four, uh, then you can see that you can draw a lot of lines that, uh, that have at least an angle of 45 degrees. Uh, if you require it to be 80% of orthogonality, that's the blue line, uh, you can see, first of all, that it grows on the logarithmic scale linearly, but even for 250, that's an enormous number. And you get easily to the millions with just 
um, uh, a few hundred observations. So the number of lines going through the origin that can be drawn randomly in Rn such that the angle between each pair of them is at least alpha grows exponentially with n. So those are the main results we're using from the convex geometry literature. And with that, and especially the result that I call key result number one, uh, the fact that the sine square of angle between random lines has a beta distribution is what we use in our, what we call beta mix. So I'm going to present the Metamix model on the next slide. I'm just going to say that the key ideas for that are this following. First of all, we flip the roles of variables and observations. And that's a very simple thing uh, to do, but <clears throat> hasn't been done that much. And I actually uh, can say that Fisher used it in 1915 and others as well, but hasn't been taken to the fullest uh, advantage. Um, but the way we think about it is we say, okay, we have P, variables and n observations, usually we think about it as how we can characterize each of the subjects by those p, uh, by the combination of the p predictors. But you can also say the, the other way around, and you can say, I have a sample of n observations. Their, uh, the relationship between them tells you something about uh, the predictor that, uh, that corresponds to that. Uh, so that's one simple thing to do. Second thing that we that we do is that we use uh, the results in convex geometry, which says that pairs of un uncorrelated predictors will be nearly perpendicular uh, with high probability when the dimension is large enough. And the third thing that we use that's uh, specifically related to what I called key result one is that the, uh, we, we construct a two component mixture model because we know under the null model, which means uncorrelated or uh, independent variables, uh, we know what their distribution of the, the sine square of the angle between them will be. It's going to be a better distribution with parameters n minus one over two and one over two. For the second component in the distribution, we just say, okay, it has to be a number between zero and one because it's the sine square of the angle. So we'll just use beta distribution without putting any constraint on the parameters, except that they have to be valid, they have to be positive. So if you write a model in, um, in terms of the log likelihood, this is just a mixture model which mixes the null distribution. So F0 is the beta distribution that we know. And F is just the beta distribution that has to be estimated. Two parameters are unknown. And M0 and M and 1 over M0 are just the indicator variable saying, are we in from is is pair J of angle, an angle between two lines. Uh, drawn at random or not. So the distributions of the components, so the first one, F0, is just what I showed before. It's the beta distribution under the assumption, under the hypothesis that we draw randomly. And the second one is just the general beta. And we assume that the indicator variables come from some Bernoulli uh, distribution with some probability P0. <clears throat> Okay, so with that notation, it is uh, almost uh, inevitable to think about the EM algorithm in order to estimate the unknown parameter. So we don't know M, and we don't know the parameters A and B. So what we do is in the M step, in the maximization step, we find the maximum likelihood estimates for A and B. And in the expectation step, we estimate the indicators by their posterior mean, which is just this expression, P0 times F0, so the probability under the null, divided by the total probability. Huh. P0 is estimated uh, through maximum likelihood estimation, very easy. So there are not too many things to estimate here, and the EM algorithm makes it very fast. Now, what we're really interested in is for every pair to say if they are from the null distribution, if they are randomly drawn or not. So if we take this expression here, this automatically says, okay, you can use the base, base theorem uh, and just ask if the posterior probability of being from the null group is under some threshold. So that's the Bayesian approach. And you can also do it with the frequentist approach. And you can say, uh, we know the null distribution and we want to control the type one error or false discovery rate or whatever it is that we want to do. So for that, we take advantage of this very well-known result that 
the art order statistic uh, has uh, a, a distribution that's basically the quantile of the beta distribution under the null of R over K plus one. So for example, if I want to have only one error in however many pairs that I have, I put R equals one and I require that uh, uh, I, I obtain the quantile of the beta distribution that corresponds to that. So that will be a strict criteria. Mm -hmm. All right, and I should also add one more result. And that was uh, actually, we, we knew it empirically, but then a referee told us, uh, you know, you can uh, generalize the results. It doesn't have to be, uh, we knew it doesn't have to be Gaussian. We knew that it works just as well for elliptical symmetry, any elliptical symmetric distribution. But the, the referee pointed out that we can uh, show it in more uh, general terms, and that turns out to be the case. That as long as the sum, or as long as the dimension, as long as n is large enough, uh, the result of the angle, the the sine square of the angle between any random lines, they can be just indicator variables, zero ones, uh, is also the same thing, beta distribution as it is before. So. This turns out to be very useful because our data can be mixed. We can have Gaussian data, we can have zero one data, and, and so on. So to summarize before going to the details of the examples, uh, I want to say the, the highlights. So first of all, our approach does not have to assume beta sparsity at all. Uh, we don't rely on normality or even elliptical symmetry. Uh, N has to be sufficiently large, but how large is large? It's not that large because in our case, if you recall from uh, my uh, the, the paper I cited by Wainwright and others, Van de Geer, <clears throat> log of P had to be, for the lasso to work, little O of 1. In our case, log of P can be big O of M. So again, this I'm saying it again, it's uh, the, the number of predictors can grow exponentially with N. That's what this is saying. And finally, there is no need for cross-validation uh, because there is no penalty term. Oh. So uh, other people have worked on uh, things that depend on correlation between angles as, as the key to that. For example, Hero and Raj Ratnam, uh, Tsai and Jiang and others. And uh, one point, and I think that's related to what Lisa was saying before about how the lasso works or when it doesn't work. And that's the second paragraph. As the dimension of the unit cube increases, so n increases, but you're still thinking about the unit cube, its volume is always one. Uh, but the maximum point between any two, the maximum distance between any two points on, on the cube uh, grows as the square root of n of the dimension. So in terms of confidence set, uh, if you take it to infinity, the L infinity ball has fixed volume, but a diverging width, which is not ideal. In high dimension, uh, it's better to use the, the sphere. Uh, confidence regions based on hypercube may be problematic because they have increasingly, exponentially increasing uh, volume. Uh, and those based on the spherical rule have a constant uh, volume. <clears throat> yeah, so again, this is known, has been known for a while, and Vol uh, phrased it in, uh, put it in other ways. Uh, in high dimension, the unit sphere, uh, as the dimension of the unit sphere increases, its volume goes to zero uh, exponentially, um, but the maximum distance between any two points stays fixed. So here are some simulations, and I'm going to uh, show a couple of them. So this is just saying how, um, how the dimension affects our ability to, to detect true correlations between lines. In this case, I put the number of predictors to be 1,000. The sample size on the left was, was used as 200, and on the right was 500, in any case, less than p. Uh, the structure of the actual data I draw from a multivariate normal distribution, uh, this is block diagonal correlation structure. Each block has 50, uh, uh, 50 uh, variables and they all have the uh, compound symmetry structure with a fairly modest correlation of 0.3. And what you see here in the green line, the green line is the distribution under the null, and, um, and the red line is the distribution that we fit from our uh, EM algorithm for the 
non-null from the ones that are not likely to come from, uh, to be drawn by chance. And the orange line here is the threshold that our software determines based on the uh, result I mentioned about the order statistic. And anything to the left of this orange line is determined to be uh, true correlation, not random. And anything to the right is considered random. So when n is small, you can see that the two components are not perfectly separated. And so we, we expect to have some kind of uh, lack of power, but uh, it's, it's actually pretty good because all these ones here on the left are detected correctly. But we control the type one error, and I'm going to show you how well we do that in the next slide, um, even in this case. But as you increase n, and remember, it's still less than p, and p can grow exponentially with n, you can see that the separation between the null component, which is the one on the right, that's the beta distribution that comes from the geom uh, complex, geom complex geometry uh, theory, and everything that's not random is very clear. So we get uh, almost perfect separation even here, even though the uh, row is not that large. And I should point out that this is not a sparse covariance matrix. In every row of the thousand by thousand matrix, we have 50 non-zero uh, values. Uh, they're block, uh, blocks of 50 along the diagonal. And the second uh, plot here shows uh, ROC curves for uh, simulated data, similar to that. Here I use P equals one, uh, 500. Um, and I increase N from 100 to 200 to 300. And again, I have a block diagonal clustered st structure with compound symmetry. Again, rho is just 0.3. And what we see here, the diamonds that we see here are the points where we, uh, that corresponds to our threshold to decide which ones, uh, which correlations are significant and which variables are correlated significantly and which are not. And the important thing here is that uh, increasing um, P, it, it doesn't change the error rate. The error rate stays the same. The false positive stays the same. What we gain is just more power uh, when we have a larger sample size. So we truly control the type one error uh, with no extra cost and uh, just uh, increasing N will only get us bigger, uh, a greater uh, true positive rate. Uh, final simulation that I'm going to talk about, it's probably uh, most related to things you've seen before uh, in previous talks, I'm guessing. Um, this is uh, a question of, about classification. We have two groups, and they're both sampled from multivariate distributions. Within group, the correlation is 0.2. Uh, and the centers of the two groups, each one is in P, uh, P dimensions, uh, half of them overlap, but the, the remaining separation, the remaining uh, difference between the coordinates uh, is enough to, to give uh, uh, good classification. This setting I, I implemented based on um, a paper by Chang et al. Uh, about the, another aspect of related to that, they call it double data piling, but I, I just use my method to, to estimate the same thing. So what you see here in the table is the classification accuracy, and I varied N and P. So let's start from the first row. If I have 100 variables and N equals 20, I have 70% accuracy. As I increase N, I increase the accuracy, and that's to be expected, and you get uh, with only 160 to 94% accuracy. What's more striking is that when you increase P, the accuracy grows. That's the blessing of the dimensionality. You see with P equals 200 and then 20, the gain in, in accuracy is fantastic. It's already 0.92. You would have to have 80 samples, uh, 80 sorry, 80 samples if you had only 100 predictors. And as you get to P equals 100, even with 20 samples, uh, you get 0.99 accuracy. And I guess, in, in a way, uh, it's related to, uh, Lisa, to your question about the classification data that I showed before, whether the sample size or the number of P is large enough and all that. Uh, yeah, you by increasing P, the number of predictors, you can do much better. You can get much better accuracy. So we get perfect classification as long as P is large enough. And that's uh, that's the uh, always what, what I find the most uh, amazing about this uh, thing. That, the blessing of dimensionality.
So this is about the simulations, and now I'm going to back going to back, going to go back to the um, examples that I talked about. So the first one was the regression setting, and again, this is uh, the vitamin B2 uh, production rate with only 71 observations and 4,088 genes. In their paper, Buhlmann and others used the lasso. And unless they really relaxed their conditions of how they define what's significant, they only found three. But most of the time, if they if they were using the lasso like uh, like they advocate doing, they get on they get no discoveries, no uh, genes associated with production rate. <clears throat> this is what we get when we fit our beta mix model. The histogram is just the histogram of the pairwise correlations between all the predictors. So it's. 4,088 by 4,088 divided by two. Uh, and this orange box here is the range where we determine that anything here, any pair that the sine square of the angle between them falls under this threshold, we'll say that it's a uh, truly significant correlation. So taking this uh, information, we can construct a uh, graphical model to say which uh, which genes are related to the production of vitamin B2, which is here at the center with the red box. And we see 106 genes that are related to that. And in fact, some of them are really highly correlated and they, uh, they form really tight clusters. So we investigated that from the uh, biological literature and those make a lot of sense. And this uh, appears to be a much more reasonable uh, model for, for that. But I should point out that what this graph is also telling us is that really the regression setting is not appropriate for this question because you see any one of these genes in the blob here on the left corner uh, has a relationship to uh, vitamin B2. But you cannot just change one of them and assume that all the other ones stay constant because they each affect each other. They are each correlated with one another. Uh, so the the... Tomato seeds, I will go a little bit more quickly over because it's there is some overlap here. And I'm just going to say, when we constructed the graphical model for the, the dry seeds and for the six hour imbibed seeds, we got some really significant uh, differences. And one of the things we see here, which I'm going to zoom in on the next slide, is that some really tight clusters form. So we put them separately and we can see one cluster here, which consists of a lot of metabolites. And the gray lines say that with the uh, in, uh, six hour imbibed seed, they were found to be correlated. The orange dashed lines say that they were also find, uh, found to be correlated in the dry seeds. So this uh, cluster B is even more uh, extreme because in the dry seeds, there are almost, there are almost no pairs that are correlated. They, are, they form a complete graph in, uh, after the, the treatment. And I also added the triangle, which are they, are they significantly different from one another, not just correlated, but is there a significant, significant difference in the mean level? And it, some, some are, some are higher, like, like this increase in one group, some are not. The small triangle means that no significant. The, the correlation gives you more information about how about how they change together. That's what I said, they, we call it the co-expression. Uh, so the, the picture is a lot more complicated than a unit change in X causes a unit change in Y because we have a whole network of uh, predictors that can change together. Next example is the bird example. And uh, again, we just took the abundance of species in different locations and what we compared, we had the matrix of zeros and ones, which species was, uh, was observed where, and we looked for correlations between locations, and then we saw the similarity between locations. Now, again, there are 601 locations, and we wanted to see how they clustered together. So we, we created their graphical model, and then I converted them to, uh, to actual graph on the map. And this is what it looks like. This is found completely unsupervised, so, the algorithm doesn't know anything about the geographical map. It doesn't have the coordinates on, 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 the, on the sphere, on the system. It just by abundance of birds, it tells you that the whole eastern part of the US is about the same, uh, you, you would see about the same number of, or same species of birds, uh, more or less up to the Missouri River. Uh, the northern parts are also very different. So 
you see Arctic and subarctic version uh, uh, regions that are very well defined by very different profiles of birds. Same thing about the Florida, the Panhandle, and the uh, West Coast. So the West Coast is interesting because there are a lot of smaller clusters that are different enough from one another, and they have some overlap. Um, and then you see a region here that has nothing. And that's probably mostly because this is very unfriendly terrain. This is the Rocky Mountains and the desert. And uh, there are just probably not enough observations there. But remember that the object objective here was to obtain a uh, covariance matrix for spatial models. And this could give you a much better uh, covariance structure because it's based on the data. And you know that points in the region called one are highly correlated, but it doesn't have to be a Gaussian. It doesn't have to be uh, based on an arbitrary model that's just for convenience. And the last example uh, that I mentioned was the classification of radar, radar data. And in this case, we see the distribution of the correlations. It's actually quite different. So you see that even in this case, where you have a lot of really highly correlated ones. So you have some that follow the, the null distribution that are mostly uncorrelated, but you have a large concentration of them that are correlated. And that's not too surprising with this kind of data. And our model can account for that. And we get from the classification, very naive classification, nothing uh, optimized. We get 91.3% accuracy, completely unsupervised. Uh, with a very high sensitivity and specificity, which is 71.2, again, based on a very naive rule. I can easily make it go up to about 90 by requiring a better majority rule for uh, how to classify things. Uh, so just like in the simulation, it, it does very good in uh, classification of two groups without any uh, big assumptions. Oh, I want to also come to one more example uh, that was not originally uh, in the original examples, but that idea of uh, the, the, the last two, especially the classification, but also the, the geographical map uh, made me think that it's possible also to do image segmentation and edge detection in uh, photographs. Uh, and this is important when you analyzing imaging data. So for example, you have MRI data and you want to know if you want to detect tumors and you want to do it automatically. Uh, so this is very useful. Or uh, crime scene data also, same thing. You want to know if some shoe fits a profile and, and so on. So um, not going into the details of how our model was uh, used to do that, uh, we just compared it to the most widely used uh, edge detection software, and that's the Canny edge detector. Uh, John Kenny developed it maybe 45 years ago, and it's still the, the standard uh, method to, to be used. Um, he treated edge detection as a signal processing problem, and he designed what he, uh, 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 what he worked on was optimal edge detector, but only in two dimensions, only in two-dimensional pictures. So here's John Kenny, the, the person. Uh, this is the Canny edge detection tool with some tuning parameter. If you change the tuning parameter, this is what you get. So you get a lot of lines that are that don't correspond really to actual features in the faces. They just fit shadows and so on. And this is what you get from our model. And now the question is, which one is Canny and which one is uncanny uh, in those? <laughs> Right, so uh, we we have uh, so for example here you can see even the the uh, the shape of the sweater that he wear, wears is captured by our software very very easily. And as an aside, I should say that my co-author's wife, Marty's wife, said when she saw that, and I uh, I'll show you the next. So 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 this is Marty. This is my co-author, and this is uh, the picture that we get from Betamix when we do the edge detection. Uh, I don't want to show Kenny's uh, version of that because it doesn't do Marty uh, any service. Uh, so when Marty's wife saw that, she said, well, if the paper doesn't work, at least you can be a street artist. So it's, uh, it's very nice. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you, can we stick this into chat GPT? We get uh, upload an image and then we start getting artists rendering of uh, of stuff. That would be a lot of fun. Probably, probably. It does. Uh, it imitates artists. So you tell it to do a Dali picture and it will do that. I, I haven't tried it. Uh, very very yeah. nice. 
<laughs> so I should say I did not add it to our slides because I, I wasn't sure, and I, I think we are getting closer to the time limits. And but but one uh, one person from Old Dominion saw this and he said, "Oh, I have an idea for using it." And and I collaborated with them. And recently we published a paper in IEEE Transactions where uh, we used it to uh, to take. There, there is a there there is a set of famous data uh, databases with uh, facial expressions, annotated uh, facial expressions, uh, happy, sad, and and so on. So it's a classification problem, and one of the problems is that again it's very high dimensional, and in addition to that, when it's so high dimensional, you cannot make sense of what each predictor means. Uh, it doesn't transfer well to other cases. So for example, if you have in the database expressions of adults. It doesn't really uh, work so well when you when you apply it to children. Uh, so what they what we did, what actually one of the graduate students who worked at it did most of the work. Uh, she used Betamix to greatly simplify the model by just getting the key features with the Betamix, and then she used the neural network methods to to do the classification for uh, uh, different expressions. And actually, the result was very good. So from Adult uh, features, uh, we were able to get good classification for child expressions. So that was uh, where reducing the the complexity of the problem by just identifying the important features by just by using correlations, just like in this example, uh, yielded very nice results. So. Uh, in summary, uh, I will just say that uh, the beta mix method uh, relies on convex geometry results, uh, which I, I, I know this is only for one dimensional uh, subspaces, uh, but I'm, I cannot uh, I cannot get over it. It's so, so nice how just from geometry of how it looks in space and how to think about, for example, classification as a geometric question, uh, you can get so much. And we don't assume sparsity. We don't assume much about the structure of the correlation or the, the data. Like it can be, actually, we don't assume anything about the structure of the correlation. It's, there's no, uh, not just not sparsity, but no structure. We don't assume block structure. We don't assume the random uh, uh, graph model, any of that. It's uh, all obtained empirically. And we get that uh, the number of uh, predictors that we can accommodate uh, is growing exponentially with n. Again, we call it the blessing of dimensionality, and Donahoe did that uh, 25 years ago, uh, and this is key to everything that we did. Uh, by using a specific model, which, again, I, I, uh, I admit is uh, right now applicable only to the case of uh, one-dimensional spaces, lines, uh, we were able to get a mixture model that we can fit easily with the EM algorithm. And I did not talk about it a lot, but there is something about it in the paper and definitely in the software that uh, when the samples are not IID, what we do as a very conservative approach is to say, okay, so our true dimension, because the samples are no longer independent, so the dimension is not N, how much, how, what is the dimension? So we estimate it from the data and we call it new and we call it the effective sample size. Uh, so similar to what you would do in, uh, for example, when uh, when you're dealing with highly correlated data and, and, and you're looking for the effective sample size to account for that. So in the example I mentioned about the facial uh, expressions, we start with N, which was, I don't know, maybe 120 or more. Uh, but the actual, because they are not independent, some people were, people were photographed with multiple expressions. So obviously they are dependent. So we obtain a new, which is much smaller than n, but still large enough to uh, to let this result, the log p's of n, kick in and and still give us the blessing of dimensionality. And some future plans that uh, we have for that uh, is one is how to extend it to longitudinal data, and that really is to to say not just lines but uh, spaces. So the simplest case is just repeated measures, even two times is spaces, uh, two-dimensional spaces in, in uh, Rn, um, we, we want to extend it to that, because again, there is no independence. Every pair is dependent, and we want to account for that. Uh, second possibility is that the 
there could be covariates that determine the correlation. Uh, we did not assume any of that. We just assumed that we identify the random ones and the non-random ones. Uh, so that's something we have to investigate. And there are other notions of correlation that can be explored. So we just use the Pearson correlation, but uh, the Pearson correlation itself depends on uh, the mean, and maybe maybe we are interested in other things. Maybe they depend on like percentiles or things like that. So. Uh, this can be extended to uh, to things that are more complicated than just the Pearson correlation, uh, but that remains to be seen. Um, I think if if I had to to summarize all of that and what what we're getting and how we're getting it is that eventually when we do inference, we're looking at uh, everything we do in statistics amounts to signal to noise ratio, like the t test. This statistic is signal to noise. And it turns out that when the dimension is high enough, the noise is really easy to detect. And so when you take out the noise, because you know how it should look like, like the beta distribution that we have here, what remains is the signal. And as you increase the, increase the dimension, the, the, the noise is, more, is, is actually easier to detect. So that's where we get the, the power of this method. And with that, I conclude. So these are some of the uh citations that i used and if you have any other questions i'll be happy to, to take them well thank you i'm for beautiful talk I, i've read your paper but um very much appreciated listening uh to you explain and especially these examples are stunning is uh this is recorded are we um uh have permission to post this i hope yeah and also I see your paper is now published. So I've right. got it. I've got the published version. We'd like to link to that as well as to your slide and put up your slides. So uh, that's okay. we'll do it. Uh, like any uh, questions from the audience? Well, if, if no one is going to ask. Um, I'll ask my favorite question. We've heard a lot about the blessings of dimension with regard to James Stein shrinkage on eigenvectors. Is, um, is there any connection? Yes, yes. Uh, the concentration of measure is the key. And um, and and that is really when... when uh, so so I, I wish I had a better answer for this, but... Uh, the thing is this, if, if you think about, so, so the, one of the first things that people criticize James and Stein for uh, saying is that well, just by adding unrelated variables, you actually can improve the, uh, the, the risk. And, and the answer was yes. And the same thing happens here. So when you, if I go back to what I showed here, this is essentially saying the same thing. So People thought that you just have to increase n to increase the power, but it turns out, and that is where the similarity to James Stein comes in. When you increase the dimension with random data, then as I mentioned about my interpretation about the, the blessings of dimensionality, is what happens is that it's not that you make the, the signal itself stronger, the signal is what it is, but you make it a lot easier to detect the noise. And that's what James Stein is doing. That's what their shrinkage is doing. So when you have a lot of things that are unrelated, they shrunk to zero, and whatever remains that was originally far enough from, from where you shrunk to uh, remains outside of, of the, the area that uh, that could just be explained by chance. So I'm not sure if that is the, the cleanest way to say it, but that's the way I, uh, I see it. Well, thank you for that. Uh, let me try one more time. Uh, any questions from the audience? I think they're all shell shocked by how beautiful this is. <laughs> well, I I, uh, I really thank you again for uh, inviting me, and I thank everybody for attending. Uh, I, I I always hope that my excitement about this field is uh, is transferred to other people because it's just so so wonderful. Now, I'm not just talking about my work, but I'm talking about in general just the beautiful mathematical results that uh, were uh, three or four years ago new to me, and I'm just so. Uh, inspired by them. So I'm, I'm happy to share it. And thank you for the opportunity.
Yeah, and thank you. And to anyone in the audience who's interested in, in applications of concentration of measure to uh, different statistical problems, uh, we are working on them. Happy to have new collaborators. Uh, so please just send me your time and email if you'd like to join. And with that, you are our final speaker of the semester. So oh, good. Um, ending uh, with a, a, a su super wonderful talk. I want to wish everybody a fantastic holiday. And of course, we'll be back next semester. So please uh, look for notes from us in the email. They'll be coming uh, early in the new year. Till then. Happy holidays. Okay. Bye-bye.